Hey everyone, Miss Lasseter here, and in today's video, we're going to be going over some tips and tricks for how to do your best on the long FRQs, which is part of the free response section of the AP Biology exam. So grab whatever study materials you need, and we're going to dive right in and go over exactly what shows up on the long FRQs on the AP Bio test. So here's the nitty gritty. The nice thing about the AP Bio exam these days is that it tells you exactly what skills it's going to test on exactly which questions of the FRQ. So for question one, it could go up to 10 points, but for the first part A, you're going to be asked to describe and explain biological concepts, processes, or models related to an experiment at hand. You'll probably see an experiment described, then see some data, and you may even see a figure or a graph in addition to that. You'll be shown a lot of information up front, Make sure you read it all and take in as much as possible, but don't let it freak you out. You're gonna to have to identify different experimental design procedures. This could be identifying what the dependent variables are, or identifying particular controls in the experiment or suggesting a particular type of procedure that could go along with this experiment. But make sure you're familiar with experimental design in order to answer part B of question one. In part C, you're gonna to need to analyze the data presented to you. Sometimes this could be doing a mathematical calculation based on numbers in a data table or a graph. Sometimes this could be looking for a trend or figuring out which group or which treatment had the largest effect in the experiment. Make sure you've practiced with a few old FRQs to see what this analysis of a data set might look like. But you don't need to justify or explain why until you get to part D. This is when you're going to make and justify predictions. If it asks you to determine a particular number set or a treatment group or identify something in part C, you don't need to explain why or make a prediction as to what happened until you get to part D where you're going to be asked to make and justify predictions, sometimes related to a later experiment that might be done in addition to the one that's already explained to you. Question two is pretty similar. In part A, you're going to need to describe and explain biological concepts, processes, or models. In part B, this is where the graph shows up. So question two, expect to construct a graph, plot a chart, and use confidence intervals or error bars. If you're taking the exam digitally, you won't have to create a graph, but you may have to interpret a graph or suggest what type of graph you might need to draw or describe a graph and how it would look. In part C, you're gonna to need to analyze data, again, similar to question one, and then part D, make and justify predictions, again, similar to question one. So how do I do well on these? Okay. Let's back up a little bit and just talk about some FRQ stuff to get us started. The free response questions come on section two, which in total is 90 minutes of the AP Bio exam. You'll be given a 10 minute reading period if you're taking the exam on paper, and then 80 minutes to answer the entire FRQ section. Now within the FRQs, there are two long questions, which are worth eight to 10 points and four shorter questions. I have a whole other video on FRQ tips in general, so please make sure you watch that too in order to do your best on the FRQs on the AP Biology exam. So remember, in general, for the FRQs, you're going to need to write these in a blue or black pen. You can use a calculator, and obviously you can use your brain. You cannot use scratch paper. You cannot use a pencil to write your FRQs, and obviously you shouldn't bring your phone to the exam day or any extra resources like a formula sheet because you'll get one and you'll be provided with any of the formulas you might need to know for the FRQs. This includes graphs. If you're making a graph on the free response questions on paper, you will have to draw them in pen. This can be a little scary to some students, but I always recommend drawing out a draft of your graph either on the FRQ question itself and then in the response section doing your final version in pen. If you make a mistake, just cross it out with one line and then write what you wanted to write below it. It's not the end of the world and the graders will understand if you need to correct something that you wrote in pen. Here are some general strategy tips. If you are doing the exam in person, use and plan your time wisely use the reading period, and plan an order of attack. There's two schools of thought here. Some people say to start with the hardest questions first. I believe starting with the easiest questions first, or what you believe the easiest questions are first, will help you knock out some easy sections and take care of parts of the exam quickly, and then go back and use the rest of your time that you have remaining on the harder questions. So I recommend starting with the easiest questions and going in that order. If you don't want to do this, that's fine too. You can always go in order from first question to last question, or you can go in order from hardest to easiest. But I recommend starting with the easiest because it'll make sure it'll give you confidence and help you answer the questions quickly without wasting too much time confusing yourself or getting lost. As you're answering the FRQs, try your best not to leave questions or sections blank. There's always some low hanging fruit or easy points that you can get from doing the FRQs. There's usually a few easy things that you can state on most of the FRQ questions that will get you a point or two. So make sure to write on all questions, even if it's some random biology knowledge that you'd like to share. And make sure you answer what the questions ask Asking. Underline the command terms in the questions that are sometimes bolded, things like justify or predict 
or draw, all of those things are exactly what the exam is asking you to do and you need to answer that directly. If it says to list two ideas or two reasons or two pieces of evidence, list two, list your best two and no more. The AP graders are not gonna accept it if you list five, for example. Some more general tips which are important to the long FRQs are that you do need to write in complete sentences. So avoid bullet point lists, outlines, and drawings. You can label the sections that the question's asking about. So for example, it may say for part A, do this. You can label part A, write your sentence out, and then part B, write your sentence out. But this shouldn't be a bullet point. You still need to write in complete sentences. You do not need to write a thesis statement or introductory paragraphs or write in flowery language. In fact, AP graders want you to avoid this. You also shouldn't have obsess over perfect grammar and spelling because points aren't counted off for spelling errors or poor sentence structure. As long as the graders know what you're trying to say, you won't be counted off if you make a spelling mistake. There are not going to be any deductions for having imperfect grammar. Please don't write introductory or closing paragraphs. You do not earn points for thesis statements or topic sentences. Don't ramble. Get to the point and answer the question. All right, so let's get specifically into the long FRQs here. These are worth more points, anywhere from 8 to 10 depending on the question. In order to prepare for these, you should definitely review experimental design. How do you design an experiment? What are variables? What are controls? What are ways to predict outcomes of an experiment? Practice making predictions or giving biological explanations of certain things. You always want to avoid certain words like love, prove, or any absolutes. Molecules don't love something. They have an affinity for something, or they tend to do something. Proving, again, statisticians will get angry at you for this, so try to avoid the word prove. You can say something supports data or something suggests something, but in general, proving is a very specific statistical term and you want to stay away from it on the AP Biology exam. And of course, absolutes like always and never, there's always going to be an exception to the rule, so you want to avoid these as much as you can. And of course, on long FRQs, gut check your response, make sure it makes sense, make sure if you've calculated something it's not a ridiculous number that doesn't make any sense, and make sure that you've done your best to answer the question. As you're working, you might need to do some math or calculate something based on graphs or data table for the long FRQs. So use your formula sheet if you need it, show any work, show the setup of the problem, especially if you're working on paper. If you have to graph, which you probably will if you're working on paper, make sure you include these things. Always include a title for your graph, always label your axes and include any units if you need to specify that, scale your graph evenly and correctly, and make sure you choose the correct graph type for the data that you're showing. If you need to show error bars, make sure you include those on the graph. These might show up as SEM, standard errors of the mean, or just a plus or minus two, for example, on your data table. So make sure if you see that plus or minus, you include those error bars as a part of your graph. When you're trying to choose the appropriate graph to represent your data, remember that a line graph is generally gonna measure something that it's a change over time. So if you see time as one of the things that is going on in the data, you probably wanna be thinking line graph. Bar graphs are going to compare individuals with different data points, so be thinking about categories or different trial runs. If it's a scatter plot, we're going to be seeing two different quantitative data points with those points meeting at a certain part on the graph. I would predict that on the AP Bio exam, you'd probably have to draw a line graph or a bar graph. Both of these can have error bars though, so make sure you watch out for those. It's unlikely you'll have to draw a pie graph, especially if they provide graphing paper or a graphing paper section for you on the exam. But Make sure to note that if you need to show percentages or components of a whole that add up to 100%, a pie graph would be appropriate. In the past, before the exam structure changed, you see that graphing showed up on the long FRQs every year from 2016 and beyond. These two first two questions are the long FRQs and will remain the long FRQs for the exams moving forward. The long FRQs are meant to be challenging and difficult and will test you on very specific things. The exam is designed with these harder questions up front and it might stress you out, but if you know that they're coming and you're prepared for them, you should be able to tackle them in a way that you can show off your knowledge and do your best possible in the exam. Don't let the exam structure of putting difficult questions up front stress you out and throw you off your game. But make sure when you're doing your graph, sketch it out, make sure you write in pen for the FRQ answer. If you have to draw lines, try to draw as straight as possible. You can't bring rulers or extra paper, but you can use your other writing utensils as a straight edge if you want. Make it fit and scale it properly. Don't draw a teeny tiny graph in one corner of the graph paper. Try to use the entire space provided. Make sure if you can that your independent variable is on the x-axis and that your dependent variable is on the y-axis. Also include the things we already mentioned, a title, 
access labels with units, and a legend if necessary if you need to shade in any of your bars or make certain patterns on your lines. When it's asking you for particular laboratory components, you need to know your difference between independent and dependent variables. Independent, think I for independent, I the researcher, what am I changing in this experiment? Dependent, think D for data. What are we measuring here? What is the data being collected in this experiment? Those are the variables you might need to differentiate on the exam. Controls can be a multitude of different things. Typically, a control in an experiment would be the condition with no treatment at all or the treatment in natural conditions. So think about that when it's asking you for what the control might be. Often water can also be used as a control in an experiment, so watch out for that. If it asks you to state a null hypothesis, you should be making a statement how the independent variables will have no effect on the outcome. You could say something like there will be no experimental difference, or the treatment has no significant difference from the control. If your null hypothesis is related to genetics, then you need to say something like the data are consistent with the predicted method of inheritance. And if you're interested in practicing graphs or looking at experimental designs, try this 2017 FRQ about caffeine and bees. I'll put the link to that in the description below, but this is easily available on the College Board's website. When you're making your graph, make sure you think about these three things. You would get three points for creating this graph with correctly plotted means on a bar graph or a modified bar graph. Now I'm telling you this ahead of time, but on the exam you may not know which type of graph you need to design until you look at the question itself. You will need to make sure you have appropriate labels, units and scaling, and then of course, correctly plot the error bars. When I created this graph, this is what it looked like. Now there's other versions of what this graph could look like. You could make your bars a little wider. You could, instead of doing a key, you could separate these bars on their own. But do notice that I've included labels and units for both my treatment groups as well as memory and I've specified exactly what memory is and what they're measuring on that y-axis. I've included my error bars and I've shaded and I've also labeled each of those bars to show the difference between each of the treatments at both 10 minutes and 24 hours. Hopefully you'll take some time to practice some of these, use the resources that the College Board provides, and the more practice you do, then the better you'll get at answering these free response questions, the long ones, questions one and questions two. Thanks so much for watching. Give this video a like if it's been helpful and I'll see you later.